frustrated because your compressed air gun blows, worse yet, doesn't blow. Painful ergonomic grip. Does it make cleanup a chore? Today I've got something a little different for you. But to be quite honest, given where this channel's been lately, I'm not even exactly sure what different even means anymore. I'm gonna share my half of a little collaboration. We'll do a little design work, mostly in CAD, I think, to build a prototype. Do some CNC and manual machining and some hand fitting, probably. I've got my hands on a little something from a very good internet friend and real life complete stranger, Jimmy Duresta. Now imagine you likely already know Duresta, he's a maker, runs a cute little channel by the same name. You should head over there after this, give him a sub, help the kid out. What you may not have known, however, is that he's also the leader of the Duresticons, sworn enemies of the Tatobots. He keeps trying to get his hands on my matrix of power, wants to make a coffee table or something out of it, I don't know. A little collaboration. The envelope, please. Introducing the Knuckle Duster, the unholy offspring of brass knuckle, paperweight, and a blowgun. You know, like an air gun you might have for your shop compressor. Duresta provided a series of sketches. We worked through them a bit. He made some 2D cutouts and mock-ups, mostly trying to get the fit and form correct, I'd assume. And he settled on this one. Artistic direction was all his, so if you think it's ugly, your beef is with him, not with me. Though, once he gets his hands on this prototype, you may want to choose your words wisely. Anyway, all I have to really work with is this hand sketch and some verbal direction from Jimmy himself. Oh, and I have one reference to mention. The holes here are one inch in diameter. The rest of this is up to us, and by us, I mean me. I think I have some latitude here. I hope I can make some minor changes to ensure this thing actually works as long as the general design direction remains what we see in his sketch here. We'll essentially be building this, engineering it I suppose, start to finish. From Jimmy's hand sketch to the working prototype. This is a blowgun, so we'll need some sort of valve and valve actuator. Second, I want to keep it easily manufacturable. Now I'll be machining this thing. In real life, it'd likely want to be a casting to save on material and manufacturing costs, but I don't really have that option here in my shop. Just looking at the sketch, gut reaction, it appears to be three major parts. The body, the valve, and some sort of lever. Of course, probably some springs and some o-rings in there too. I'll want to use standard threads on the inlet and the outlet so he can use standard quick disconnects on one end and standard nozzle on the other. Like if he wants to beat the living daylights out of his basketball, but needs to fill it first, he can put one of those needle inflator tips on this. The first thing I needed to do was get Jimmy's sketch into CAD and turn it into real parts. I'll have a follow-up video shortly about the CAD, my CAD process, what I think is the best way to tackle these kind of projects, and most importantly, what to wear while doing CAD so you're comfortable but can still turn heads. For now, suffice to say, this is what we're building. This is my best guess at real parts that hopefully work. At the time I did this, I opted to go for a two O-ring shuttle valve, but have since changed my mind. We'll see more on the valve later. For now, let's start making some parts. Let's start with the actual body of the blowgun. I wanted to jump right into this with brass, but I've decided to go with aluminum for now for a few reasons. There have been some changes in the design that Jimmy has seen and okayed, but hasn't mocked up yet. This is a prototype, so more changes are likely to happen. Brass is expensive. I don't have any brass. So I need a small piece of aluminum I can carve a blower body out of on the CNC. Although I'd usually just cut something like this on the saw for the CNC router, since this will be a two-sided machined part, I opted for something a little bit more precise. So I got it in my head to really try to push this cut. So instead of clamping the work in my vise, I'm using a fixture plate. A fixture plate will let me clamp straight down instead of squeezing the part in the vise jaws. Wouldn't be a problem on the first side, but there'll be a lot less material when I flip the part over to sort of hold up to the squeezing forces of the vise jaws. This is John's mini pallet from Saunders Machine Works, NYC CNC. First time I'm using it, and so far I really like it. Very convenient. The holes are half reamed and half threaded, so I can use a mix of dowels or screws in any one of the locations. This takes quarter inch dowels and quarter twenty threaded fasteners. There's nothing exceedingly precision on this part, on the body, so I'm using a slip of paper. 
slip of paper works great here and is faster than switching to an edge finder or less hassle I suppose call me lazy I've set the machine up for a 150 thou depth of cut, that's 4 millimeters. I really should be using a 2 flute, but I've only got 4 flute carbide end mills. I'm pushing it about 55 inches per minute, that's 1400 millimeters per minute. I'm watching this close and manually blasting with air, occasionally throwing in some WD-40. I had disconnected the relay for the air when I was screwing around with the fourth axis, I think, but never hooked it back up. This isn't smart, manually trying to blow chips out like this, but you know, it is lazy. Anyway, the little router was really moving some material. Not too shabby, I don't think, for a CNC router. I did notice on the display on the camera these tool marks look horrendous, but they're actually quite smooth. Quick lick with some sandpaper, I'm sure those will clean right up. I did notice a mismatch in X direction. That's about, I don't know, 25 or 30 thou. In the Y direction, it's right on. So when I flip the part, I think I did this side first. When I flipped it, the Y was correct. The X shifted for some reason. Either the work moved, or I didn't do a good job of picking up the origin again. Anyway, it's a lot better than I could have done on a manual mill. So it's got some character. I want to set this up and clean up the surfaces that I then need to come back in and port and thread. It's also a little bit heavier than I was expecting. I was concerned that in aluminum this was going to be much too light, but it feels pretty decent. So it seems to have gone well. I was really nervous about breaking through some of these thinner walls. So I think now I can go ahead and put some time into finishing, removing the tool marks, deburring, that sort of thing. Make it pretty. Again, the tool marks are really very superficial, so some light sandpaper should make quick work of this. I think I'm going to call this good enough for now. I don't want to go too crazy with this thing till I know that it actually works. Speaking of which, the next thing I'll need is the valve itself. This style of valve is called a shuttle valve because it shuttles back and forth between the on and off position. They're really quite simple and usually pretty reliable. It has three O-ring grooves and a counterbore at the bottom for a spring. This is the return spring, so the blowgun doesn't stay always on when you press the lever down. The original design only had two O-rings. I've since added a third, and I'll try to explain why. Previously, when I had just the two O-rings, air was coming in, let's say from the right, at about this level, below the shuttle valve, below the piston here. It would try to come up the valve, but be stopped by this O-ring. So then when you push the lever, the O-ring would come below the air inlet. Air could flow around this reduced section and out the nozzle without leaking through the top of the blowgun. That's what this top O-ring is for. But what would happen with just those two O-rings, although it wouldn't leak, 
it would require a lot of additional force to actually actuate the blowgun. Because when the air is coming in from the bottom, it's now filling up the chamber below the shuttle valve. And all of this area is sort of being acted upon by the compressor air. So you'd be pushing against 90 PSI air or so, trying to actuate it, and then the pressure would drop once you broke through this seal or came past it rather. It's maybe a bad choice of words. The way it's set up now with two O-rings is the inlet port ends up right about here in the middle. So the air can neither come up through the top and out the blowgun or down through the bottom and under this piston trying to push it up. All right, I'm quite anxious. Let's oil this up a bit and put it together. Okay, so that's a little difficult to make out because I'm missing the actuation lever. The lever would give me some mechanical advantage over the spring because you're actually pushing, I don't know, about a half inch or three quarter inch more forward. But in order to test it, I've got to get air into the back. So on the air inlet, I made a bit of a mistake, an oversight on my part. I should have checked. I was convinced that the threads on the back of air compressor quick disconnects was an eighth NPT. Turns out they're not or at least the ones I have aren't. They're a quarter inch NPT. So the thread in the back is an eighth. I don't really feel like driving out to pick up an eighth size quick disconnect. So for now, I'm just gonna use a little adapter. That should work fine for testing, but I'm gonna need some Teflon tape on here. The threads on the air inlet, both on the quick disconnect and in the blowgun are tapered threads. And the only adapter I have is straight threads. So this will leak like a sieve without some tape on there. Okay, so when I plug this thing in, one of two things might happen. The first, ideally, absolutely nothing. Second, the pressure could shoot this shuttle valve clean across the room and out my garage window. All right, so now in theory, the air is not getting past the bottom two set of O-rings, it can't get underneath the valve, and it can't break my garage door. No leaks anywhere. All right, I think this might just warrant being stoked. I can now make the lever. Aww. This is cold rolled steel, three eighths of an inch thick. Routing steel always makes me nervous, but frankly, I think I have less problems with steel than any other material, though maybe because I'm more cautious with it. That's a small four flute carbide end mill, Chinese water torturing the stock, taking 60 thou depth of cut, about a millimeter and a half, at 12 inches per minute, 300 plus millimeters or so. Took about six passes to get through it. There wasn't too much to the lever, but let me bring you in for a closer look. Now, something like this in production would be uh, probably a stamped sheet metal part. I don't really have the tooling to make a part like this. So as you saw, I just sort of profiled it out of a piece of cold rolled steel. I cored out some of the bottom area here, of course, for clearance for the hinge. There's two small features in the back. I'll show those to you in a minute, but they set the height of the lever up at the business end. And then I really just sort of broke the sharp corners off with some Scotch-Brite. For this final assembly, I'm gonna use a slightly longer spring. This is the spring we used earlier in the initial test. Now with the longer spring in there, the valve will sit higher in the bore than it did before. Were I to connect air in this case, it would most definitely fire this valve out the top. But this time, I'll have the lever installed. With the lever attached, these two bumps behind the hinge set the height here at the top, set the height at the valve. And if I did my math right, the valve should be in the right position so no air gets underneath of it, but I still have some spring preload against the lever. That higher spring load from the slightly taller spring will preload the lever up against that stop, taking up any of the, I guess, sort of slop or clearances, giving it a much better feel.
All right, let's give her a try. No leaks. No rattling. It's got quite a kick, but actuation force feels good. I've actually got a reasonable amount of control of the airflow, given the, I don't know, what I thought was maybe a little bit of a shortish stroke. All right, there it is. Bumpy ride, but we got there. And I think stuck pretty true to Jimmy's sketch. Now I'm going to pack this up and ship it off. Be sure to check out his channel for his thoughts and where he's going with this. If you'd like one of these, in brass I'd imagine, and without the 10-pound solid steel lever, he's the guy to talk to. Though this is a prototype, so there may be some changes once he gets his hands on it. Well, hope you enjoyed watching this come to life. As I mentioned earlier, I'll have a follow-up to this video that gets more into the CAD and design details. So if that's the sort of thing that floats your boat, keep an eye out. I hope to have it up soon. As always, thanks for watching.